Okay, welcome everyone to the second edition of the Meet the Author um, program as part of the Physiotherapy EHAD uh, committee's plan to uh, provide additional education uh, for physiotherapists working in haemophilia. Uh, so today we welcome Paul McLaughlin um, from the Royal Free Hospital Haemophilia Centre um, in the UK and we're going to have a chat today with Paul about his paper that he published last year uh, that looked at physiotherapy interventions for pain management in haemophilia, a systematic review. Uh, so welcome, uh, Paul. Hello. First of all, can you tell us uh, what the aim of the paper was? So I think that the aim of the paper was to look at um, uh, evaluating the effect of uh, looking at physiotherapy interventions um, that are currently used um, uh, for pain management in people with haemophilia. The, we know that pain is a big problem um, and it's widely acknowledged as a problem and it's a personal and clinical issue. Um, but uh, in the literature, generally they seem to be a bit more around haemophilia, hemostatic treatment, uh, of which pain is a part and actually pain management in itself is, is fairly um, sort of underrepresented, I suppose, in the literature, certainly around haemophilia. And then when you get into um, uh, looking at sort of uh, physiotherapy for sort of pain management in haemophilia, um, it's still a relatively new scope of practice, maybe, if that's a better term. Um, but, uh, you know, but there are papers out there. Um, and, and actually my sort of interest is sort of the wider tenets of physio, but also specifically looking at exercise and rehabilitation strategies within pain management. And so a systematic review was decided upon to, to sort of investigate essentially what's been done, how good was it, how was it reported, and what were the outcomes um, mm -hmm. uh, where pain was, was looking at. And so we did a, um, looking at <clears throat> overall physio interventions, um, but with the primary outcome being pain and secondary outcomes being uh, effect on quality of life and function. Okay. So why do you think this, this type of review is, review is important for physiotherapists? Um, I think it's important because I see systematic reviews. Systematic reviews are, can be dull <laughs> for people to read, let's be honest. Um, they're often fairly hefty, um, sort of tomes of statistical, what appears to be statistical analysis and, and quite dry um, material. Um, but I also think on a practical level, systematic reviews can, can produce a line in the sand, a sort of an idea of where we are now, what are we doing, why are we doing it, uh, why are we choosing to investigate the things we're investigating. Um, and I, I think for... I see it very much as evidence-informed practice rather than evidence-based practice. Um, and being able to sort of see a critique or a sort of a, a, an appraised process of, of what techniques and what interventions are used for pain, as it is here in this point with, with people with haemophilia, um, hopefully, if people read it, they begin to question their own practice and reflect their own practice as to why are they doing what they do. And, what do they think is happening when they're doing these, these sort of interventions? Um, and also, I suppose on a, on a sort of more academic scholarly level, actually, what are the quality of the papers that we're currently using to inform our practice? What is the current quality of the evidence that is currently the backbone of our practice? And certainly if we're, we're looking to sort of develop the physio role as a key member of comprehensive care, certainly within overall management of people in the video, we have to be aware of the good and the bad um, in the evidence that we have at our disposal um, and, you know, how that works in clinical practice, but also for those looking to do research, actually systematic reviews sort of identify sort of gaps and identify problems with current published literature. And so hopefully it helps to inform further um, yeah. development of studies. <clears throat> no, you're right. It's systematic reviews are you know, time consuming to do and they, you know, take a, they take an enormous amount of work, don't they? Um, 
Why did you choose to do it that way? And, and, and what's the difference between a systematic review in what you published um, and just a sort of normal literature sort of narrative review and what it, what it tells us and what information we gather from that? So I suppose you can consider, if we consider literature review as a concept, if we consider narrative review as a concept, we consider systematic review as a concept. And actually on a, an evidence-based triangle, sort of literature review sits at the top, narrative reviews, rightly or wrongly, sit at the middle and systematic reviews are, are seen at the top. Literature reviews are basically qualitative summaries um, where you're looking very broadly at a topic. So that would be physiotherapy in haemophilia. And then you would sort of identify all the types of physiotherapy, all the outcome measures, and you would provide a very general overview. You know, you provide a general understanding of, of what's going on. A narrative review <clears throat> is seen as a, a critical overview of the literature, um, where you're actually, it's been described as a scholar, scholarly summary, um, where you're given interpretation and you're given critique. But, and you then provide a, a sort of a written assessment at the end, which is your, your sort of your review. Um, however, they are seen still, but even with that level of rigor that they are inherently subjective and the fear is or they can some can be interpreted that the authors cherry pick papers within the narrative review to justify their own position so there's a, um, a suggestion of bias um, potentially in some of the narrative reviews um, but narrative reviews are probably better for giving um, deepening an understanding of an area actually um, and they sort of provide a, a, um, an, a, an authoritative, a good authoritative argument because they're often written by somebody who knows the area, who's um, uh, known in the area, who's trusted in the area. So actually it comes with all of that kind of stuff as well. And probably narrative views have a bit more use in, in, in developing policy um, because actually it's a bit more um, real worldy and a bit more plausible um, in its use. So it has a slightly larger um, uh, question, whereas a systematic review, as almost you get to the top of the triangle, you're also getting to the top of, um, it's a very, very structured, predetermined um, review of, of the current state of affairs of evidence that's out there. It often um, has a very tight research question. And so by virtue of having a very tight question, you then exclude potentially quite a lot of other things that don't meet your criteria. So the biggest comment around systematic review, certainly around diseases that are rare or where there's potentially low numbers is the fact that they exclude everything else apart from randomized control trials. So, you know, if we're looking at evidence quality, systematic reviews are looking very much at, at the quality of, of the evidence. Um, and they are very good for, answering a narrowly focused question. So you're looking for the effect of an intervention on a specific disease process in a specific group of people. It, a systematic review is actually very good for that. Okay. It removes the bias because it's, you follow a, a sort of predetermined set of criteria yeah. that anyone else can then look back and say, you did or you did not follow that criteria. So the Cochrane collaboration is one of the most famous sort of systematic review proponents. Okay, I mean, that's a great sort of um, description, really. So the, the, those, those narrative literature reviews just sort of give us a story and a bait, that's an understanding of a topic, whereas that systematic review focuses on the evidence for a specific question. And I suppose what was the question that you had in this that you were trying to answer? Um, and, and were you able to answer it? And what was the answer? So the question was, for us, it was for looking at the effectiveness physiotherapy interventions for pain management hemophilia so on the face of it that looks quite specific but also physiotherapy interventions in itself is quite broad um, and we made a decision to have include physiotherapy interventions because physiotherapy by its nature is multifaceted in, in what it provides um, so we looked at all the studies that met our inclusion criteria so the inclusion criteria were um, people with hemophilia any severity any age um, where physiotherapy, we had already ascribed what we would include within physiotherapy techniques. And 
where outcome measures included pain as they had to include pain as an outcome measure. And then anything else after that was pain, um, uh, function, quality of life as our secondary. So they had to have sort of um, outcome measures uh, or outcomes associated with that. But, um, <clears throat> we use Cochrane collaborative, we use the Cochrane collaboration approach for the methodology. So you essentially, you screen the papers, you sort of work collaboratively with somebody else who's blinded to what you're doing. And actually we ended up with, um, so what we're looking at the study population, people with hemophilia, the intervention, physio, the control group, if they had one or not, um, uh, what the control was, measures used, the statistical results, so they're essentially their findings. Um, and then you do an overall assessment of bias. And the bias is not that I predetermined that it's, there's a bias, it's actually the Cochrane Collaboration have a, an assessment tool for bias where you look at specific qualities of paper reporting, of blending, of, of sampling, things like that. And you, you give them a, a sort of a mark towards that. We found we had nine studies included in our um, review. Uh, a variety of physio methods, so manual therapy, exercise, hydrotherapy, so electrotherapeutic agents such as laser. Um, and overall, we found that there was quite a lot of heterogeneity um, as, a, as a, the sort of first finding. Um, what do you mean by that? So we termed it that basically lots of the studies included um, adults and children um, and some included both. Um, they included people with severe, moderate and mild in the same sort of study, but also across all of the studies. It wasn't just all in severe, it wasn't just all in moderate and mild. We felt that that's an important finding because actually if you're looking at pain management, um, if you're looking at sort of uh, musculoskeletal comorbidity management of which pain is a problem, that still remains that that mostly affects people with severe hemophilia because people with severe hemophilia are most at risk of bleeding. Mm -hmm. And so heterogeneity is an important co-founder because actually what you can't describe in a systematic view, but you could in an art review, but is actually to say, you know, dig deep into is pain in somebody with mild hemophilia the same as pain experience as somebody with severe hemophilia, given that their treatment histories will be very different and their exposure to bleeding may be very different. So that's the sort of example there of why heterogeneity is important. We found that um, there was, every study that we included uses, used the visual analog scale for pain or the numerical rating scale, essentially a zero to 10. Um, and that was regardless of whether there was acute or chronic pain, not that anybody actually sort of identified to you. But I think one of the most important thing we picked up was that although all of these studies included pain as an outcome measure, none of them included pain as an inclusion criteria. So already there is a slight problem with, was there a presumption that if they have hemophilia, they will have pain, um, which is actually not a good place to start because that would suggest that you then are measuring an outcome that is irrelevant to somebody who's included within the, the, the study. Um, and also it, it became part of a package of outcome measures, which actually was um, quite clear that although many looked at range, looked at VAS, looked at muscle strength, looked at circumference, looked at some fun very little, very, very few um, looked at quality of life and or function in conjunction with pain management. And so there seemed to just be a battery of outcome measures, which we sort of demonstrated um, we didn't make so much of a comment on it because again, that's where a narrative review, basically a systematic review presents the quality of the evidence and you use very sort of rigid criteria to talk about it. A narrative review may have been able to delve a bit deeper into that as to why, why all the outcome measures and actually is that more of a justification of the technique for the physio or is it actually a meaningful outcome to the person receiving the technique? So actually, you know, these interventions, as you can start to see where the, some of the hazy gray areas are. Um, we found an overall risk of bias in the studies and that's no reflection on the authors. This is just a reflection on how the study is reported in the literature. So you have to take into account how perhaps uh, limits and, and, and things like that. So there's always a sort of acknowledgement that 
some of the stuff was probably done. It just wasn't written down in the in the reporting. Um, but that's important because you have to know for high quality yeah. research that actually they're using high quality standards um, when they're delivering it. Um, it wasn't all bad in the sense that we did find that techniques, um, we found that for many looking at pain, there was, um, it was unclear, how, uh, unclear evidence and how effective they were. So when we sort of looked at the sort of the, the effect that it, we couldn't say for certain that one thing was better than another. Um, apart from the uh, study that you once sort of used hydrotherapy showed a clear benefit of hydrotherapy over land-based exercise and no treatment at all. However, even with that one, the land-based exercise still showed benefit over nothing at all. And so you can start to see where, oh, the hydrotherapy was better than land based uh, for pain. That's interesting. You know, because, uh, so the idea of exercise. Finding, it? Yeah. And it's, it's that's where you start to look at the nuances that you could say, well, we should all do hydrotherapy. But actually, when you look at it again, hydrotherapy remains exercise. It's just in yeah. water. So it's actually, um, and also there's a, there's a realistic premise there that for some of them, there was three weeks of intervention for others it was 12 weeks for some people it was once a week for some people it was three times a week for 12 weeks so there's a huge amount of difference in in, in how, you, how these things were applied you should have mentioned that you know maybe these results were you know results of their studies the effect was quite variable um, and probably related to, to the heterogeneity of the study and the population and the difference in time measurement and outputs um, so that, you know these these these, inter these interventions that you found might be effective. Um, if if physiotherapists were going to undertake some research to look at these things in more detail, uh, what would you sort of any suggestions on how they might go do that to 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 make these studies better? Um, arguably, if you're looking at evidence of effect, we then have to ask what it is you're measuring, are you choosing the right thing to measure that effect with? But actually, does the thing you're measuring matter to the person you're doing it with? So actually, does VAS adequately reflect for pain, the day-to-day -day living with it, and the fact that it VAS can fluctuate on a day, never mind across a week, never mind across a period of physiotherapy intervention. So actually, is there some other way of assessing or recording an improvement that perhaps mm -hmm. gives a bit more um, pragmatic, like realistic, you know, how, how, to, to yeah, how, yeah. And, yeah. And, and I think traditionally physio has suffered from uh, the need to provide numbers and a before and after and a sort of numerical difference. But actually, if uh, you're looking at sort of, I don't know, before and after orthopedic surgery, that's probably all right because orthopedic surgery often exists to quite substantially change a pain, a, a, a sort of pain problem. Whereas if you're sort of looking at pain um, or muscle strength as a problem, is that muscle strength that you've assessed is a problem and therefore you've instigated a treatment plan? Or are you measuring muscle strength because you as the physio believe this technique should make muscle strength better? And actually, does the person with hemophilia care about muscle strength or the fact that their range of movement is improved by five degrees? But actually, it may do if there's a functional component to an assessment that says, actually, that five degrees now means I can brush my teeth or shave if it's an elbow, for example. And it's, it's about why you're doing it and why you, what will it tell you, but also what it tells you is the academic interest but actually, is it of any use to the person participating in the study? And we really have to, I think, as physios, ask ourselves those questions and perhaps really think better about what it is we're doing both clinically, but also from an, an, a research academic perspective. Yeah. And perhaps have, you know, you have patients involved in... Yeah. Um, and research questions, isn't it? Absolutely. I think it's this idea that um, moving away from a, a sort of paternalistic uh, physio is right, telling a patient what to do, this is the procedure that you need to follow for 12 weeks, as opposed to 
what things matter to you, a sort of personalised, individualised approach to their problem, outcome measures that matter to them and actually report a before and after problem. And that takes you into a much broader conversation, probably not for this uh, catch up, but around are things like randomized controlled trials suitable for rare diseases that have, that have got smaller numbers or diseases such as hemophilia, severe hemophilia, where before they are already physically complex by virtue of the fact that they have usually one or two, more than one or two joints affected. Um, so they are already different from a, a weighty group of people or um, they are predominantly mostly, mostly men, which is slightly different from the rheumatoid arthritis population where you sort of see the data. So you can start to see where the complexity of problems lies and how, you know, is RCT an effective way of answering your question? Um, um, you know, though, uh, but that's a, that's a discussion for another day, but it, yeah. it does raise those, we should be having those conversations. We should be thinking perhaps more cleverly about um, effective study design yeah. um, and interventions that matter. And that comes back to involving people with hemophilia from the off and actually getting them involved with um, identifying things that matter, but also interventions that matter as well, that actually and how those are delivered and, and you know, realistically fitting in with their life if they're, you know, can we expect someone to come for physio three times a week for 12 weeks if they're a man in their 40s who has a job? Yeah. You know, there's all these these sort of things that we need to be mindful of. Um, and, and actually, this those kind of studies are difficult to replicate in real life because they don't match real life. So, yeah, I think that's a really important point. In, you know, in a rare disease, being able to conduct fully powered randomised trials Will be, will be probably impossible to have sufficient numbers or, or very extremely challenging. Um, and, and perhaps to do that, we need to, you know, there needs to be sort of collaboration across sort of research groups probably to try and achieve that. But if, if, that, if you know, fully powered randomised trials are not possible, it, it's important that, you know, what we're, we're testing and the questions we're answering and the outcomes we're measuring are patient focused yeah. and, and relevant to, and to the patient and of that value to them, isn't it? Um, so that's a really important point. I think, and I think that's, you know, just the systematic review really was a real academic, very structured uh, review to answer a specific question, but it sort of raises those sort of points that, you know, to move forward, what can we do about that? So I think that's, was, you know, uh, really sort of important. That's what I sort of got out of the, uh, that systematic review. And so in terms of you've done this review and you've found some, some interesting findings and you've sort of uh, learned some things about, sort of, you know, that design methodology, are you planning to follow on with any work um, as a result of what you found out? Yes. <laughs> Simple answer. Yeah. So uh, on a, a practical level, a systematic review was the opening gambit to a lot of my PhD work that followed. Um, and so we used a systematic review to explore and identify the, the sort of the gaps in the current understanding of physio generally, but also more specifically for me around hemophilia, physio, rehabilitation, exercise, pain, and that sort of um, as an intervention. Um, so the systematic review for us broadly informed a body of work that came after um, where we um, had some uh, qualitative studies. So we looked at interviews, focus groups um, with people with hemophilia and healthcare professionals around the idea of their pain experience, the beliefs and the ideas and the thinking behind doing sort of rehab exercise based approaches as, a, as an intervention for pain management. Um, and then that the systematic review plus the general literature review narrative review plus the interview focus group data was then all taken together and, and funneled into um, a process where we worked with people with hemophilia and uh, clinicians to essentially design a protocol um, for an exercise based 
intervention for pain management. So the outcome measures that were chosen were determined from uh, what we identify from a systematic review, but also what people with hemophilia felt they wanted to be asked at the end of, a, of a, um, an intervention um, <clears throat> and everything, sort of all the practicalities around it. So the systematic views are sort of lying in the sand at one end of my PhD, but the, the things about systematic reviews is that they should be redone. So five or six or seven years from now, I would hope somebody else revisits that entire topic. And instead of nine studies, there are 29 studies. And actually we're starting to show that, you know, as the years go on, that we're, we're able to see what has gone before, improve again, improve again, and actually start to, to sort of look at um, evidencing what matters. And I think that's quite important. So you can have evidence of effect and have a p-value that's amazing and have a highly efficient, you know, if you do a strengthening program and they get stronger, that's an effect. But it comes back to, but actually if they're stronger, it doesn't matter. Does it help them do the things they want to do? And I think we have, it has to be tied in with, with real life application. Otherwise it remains a, an academic venture, um, which, for, which is fine, but actually, you know, we, we are looking at, at a, across, certainly in the UK and across Europe to get more physio provision, more physio time, better physio, getting physio supported to do more work with people with haemophilia. And, you know, for those people with haemophilia having a benefit to the physio as well. So actually you know, we need research and, and, and stuff that actually feeds into that um, as well to, to, as I say, to inform practice. Yeah. About. Well, you know, I think we really look forward to hear, hearing, you know, about what you do next and some of the results from that sort of really patient focused work that you're doing. Because uh, pain, pain management is a really crucial area, you know, for managing the sort of care of people with haemophilia. And even with newer treatments, people with existing arthropathy are still going to, to experience pain. Um, and so we, we, that, it's a really sort of important area and really important that we uncover the best way to manage uh, that in the future. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm very aware that my proposition is very one small part of a sort of entering into that. But, you know, if enough of us are doing small parts, some of the small parts become yeah. the bigger sort of mobilization of things. Um, and yeah, it's, yeah, it's, uh, yeah need to know more basically yeah good luck um and you know again thank you for joining us today um i really appreciate the you know the time you put in and you know the hard work that went involved in undertaking the systematic review and, and writing it um and publishing it uh, and for, for all our benefit both for you know those of us who are involved in research but also for um clinical relevance for sort of people managing people with hemophilia i think it's a really important uh paper uh so well done and thank, thank you very much bye thank you